<laughs> All right, first thing is first, on Friday, I'm going to go, let's go Monday, let's do it Monday. There will be a quick little quiz on chapter 23, which is the progressives. There will be no more than 40 questions. I guarantee there will be less than 40 on chapter 23. Okay. And hopefully I'll have the little review list for the test, for the next unit, for the unit test, which will be a big one. Which will be next week is going to be on the populist, the imper uh, basic diplomacy, imperialism, and the progressive era. But as soon as we get that test done, it's smooth sailing. Just smooth sailing. What do we do after that? War. war, war. Just war. war. Right. We do World War One in the twenties. That'll be the next unit. Then the Great Depression's a unit. World War Two. Only problem World War Two is that's right around. We'll be finishing that up for right before spring break, so we'll kind of talk about it in there. May 8th? It's a Friday. So I think it's the second Friday of May. Right. On the Vigilante Parade Day. So. I love the idea. I really like the idea of a parade. I like a float in the parade. Yeah, I, I really like that. Idea. I really like that idea. You like the little red stinger and the red stinger? Yeah, that's it. Oh, you should have done this so funny. Oh, I want to make that. All right, so I, I want to get to the progressive, so I want to do a couple things on the progressive so that I can talk about the jungle. So no sharp people. The pen remains standing. Did you see that? Did you see that? Yeah. Did you see that? It was too quick. It was too, I know, I'm like a cat. Sugar water. Ah, you know it's good for you because what's the number one ingredient? Sugar. High fructose corn syrup. Sure. I eat that for free. Which, yeah, which is only mostly possible. Okay, so. Okay, write down one more thing for imperialism. I forgot to mention the great, did I mention the great white fleet? No. Just put down the great white fleet. After, who was the yellow peril? Who was, what country? And what was the rebellion in China? And... Oh, the U.S. engineered a revolt, panel revolted against what country? Colombia. Colombia, very good. Who was the guy who came up with the... Boina Villa. Boina Villa was the, the Frenchman who was in Panama, but who figured out that, that mosquitoes were causing malaria and yellow fever? Dr. Walter. Reed and Gorgas, but Reed's the one we really need to know. <laughs> My race. The regular razors don't work, so I gotta use a rag. Philip says that too. Okay, the, right now the Great White Fleet. After the, the Russo Japanese War, oh, what treaty ended the, the Russo Japanese War? Ooh, Fort Smith, yeah. Who was mad after that treaty? About their yeah. Yeah. The United States in 1907 sent a significant part of their modern fleet called the Great White Fleet. On a worldwide tour. Yeah. Is this still so Wait, what's. Is it, it, is it the Great White Fleet is right after the Russian Japanese War, so it's related to that. And they sent this fleet around the United States. They painted the ships white instead of the color they're using more and more gray. And the reason why is to show that it's peaceful, but it's still American, The uh, much of the modern American Navy, even though the ships will be obsolete very soon. Great White Fleet. They sailed around the world, it's partially you know, to show the flag, to show America is now on the world stage. But the big reason was... Huh? Say it louder? Of who? Japan. They stopped in Japan, they stopped in a couple of places in Japan. Okay, you beat Russia, but... Even though the, Russia had a much bigger army than the U.S., you know, we were saying we still have a fleet, we're still here, so it's kind of setting the stage for what's going to happen. All right, so now I'm going to finish imperialism. And imperialism goes in very well with the next movement, the next part of this unit. We did populist, imperialist, now the progressives. The progressive era. 
And the thing about the progress is we will talk about the jungle. The jungle fits into this. This is part of a continuum. And so one, remember one of those historical things we had to do a long time ago, and I just wanted to introduce up the idea that you can have how you can have one movement or one event, and how over time things will either be the same or kind of change a little bit. This is part of a continuity, the progressives. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, like separate from imperial. Yeah. It's related, but it's separate. And so we have. And this goes all the way back, this kind of continuum of thought. So on one side, you have the more laissez-faire economics that would eventually become trickle-down and supply-side economics, social Darwinism, that continuum. And then the other continuum, which the progressive era fits in, where you go back to Jefferson, then to Andrew Jackson. The same continuum of thought that would lead to labor unions. Than the, than the populace. And the whole thing that ties these together, even though obviously they're different attitudes for different uh, eras. Jefferson's pre industrial revolution, Jackson's the beginning of it, the first real impact, what happened to farmers, but the idea of what about average people, working class people, or fear of inequalities created by the new economic system, people who felt kind of left out. Well, in the same continuum as the progressives. The same continuum, this progressive era. That's what they were called. Mm -hmm. okay. The progressives. Now, there's there's no, um, the progressives weren't all just Republicans, they weren't all just Democrats. There was uh, a vast de uh, degree of difference between different progressives. So there's characteristics that are similar, but it's a very much a hodgepodge. But to keep the continuum goal going, then you have something like the New Deal, which was Franklin Roosevelt. The same kind of continuum. <laughs> and that would go into the post-World War II liberalism. All the way through the um, Lyndon Johnson, the Great Society. So I'll give you this continuum all the way through into the 1970s. And then liberalism really took major hits for lots of reasons. And it appears to be coming back. We have an interesting time. I mean, it just, things make a cycle. They always seem to make a cycle for various reasons. A cop, and the one basic concept is, as I mentioned before, the idea of average people helping them out, but also this concept that there are problems and we can't solve them. So that's a different attitude than the more laws that fair as well. There's problems, but we can work on it. You solve them for yourself. What is it today? What appears to be happening on the same continuum. Yeah, there's there's kind of a growing, maybe not full fledged socialism, but a kind of a Socialism, democratic socialism, or they would call it the social democrats of Europe. They're making a real, I mean, it's clearly happening. I don't know how much of an impact it's going to be, but for younger people, it appears to be like a, a major movement right now, They're like huge. I don't remember we live in Montana, so we're very isolated. Sorry. Or maybe that's good. And I mean, there's no, no coincidence that this is happening again. The same continuum you can see, like today, that's the people voting for Bernie Sanders or that same continuum. Does that make sense? I'm not saying they would all agree, but it's the same kind of continuum over time. So that's kind of the last one. <laughs> and I, I don't know if Sanders is, you know, I think Sanders, in a way, is kind of riding the wave. Because I don't know if 74 year old socialists from Democratic Socialist Vermont are actually going to lead a new wave. He's so Yeah. He's, he, and he's remarkably good shape. But still, 74 is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the progressive era is just like a little section. Yeah, a little section. So basically, the progressive era begins in the 1890s and will go to the, until World War II. Actually, the last progressive era major uh, amendment to the Constitution will be 1920. So 1890s to 1920, the same time as the populists, they have many of the same ideas. And one thing we have to get, a lot of the populist reforms, like income tax or direct election of senators, are going to come about in the progressive era. And so there's a big similarity, but there's also some major differences. Major differences, totally different attitude. 
because the populist working class and farmers ground up progressives it's more top down it's more i know what's good for you in this progressive era and so we can be on the same continuum but like i said they're not always going to be exactly the same at all so let's get a couple of the characteristics of a progressive the progressives have certain things, but let's be clear about it. Not everyone's the same. There was there were progressive Democrats, there were progressive Republicans. For a couple times, they tried a progressive party. Teddy Roosevelt would be the nominee of the progressive party in 1912, the Bull Moose Party. There'd be another progressive attempt in 1924, Robert Law left. He did very well in the election, but they were short-lived. And most of the Republican, the, there would be Republican progressives for a long time. Not anymore. They're gone. That's a third state. And Democratic ones. So, what are some of the characteristics? Number one, this real belief that society can improve. Society can improve. We can make a better society. And if we can make a better society, yes, we can do it as individuals. Yes, we can do it by helping out. By trying to make a better world around us, and I'm going to be clear about it, everyone's going to have a different attitude towards this, what that actually means. But to really make the improvements so society can improve, it's got to be government. Only government can do it. Government can do good things. In fact, government usually does. Because it's made of people. That's a very positive attitude towards people. Should we have that? I mean, look at people the worst. Everywhere. All these rooms are filled with them. That means they totally rejected what idea for no government interference? Totally rejected laws I fair. We can't have laws I fair. Because to the progressives, laws I fair by definition favors them. the rich. Yeah, the big. Whoever's the biggest, because they have a competitive advantage. Laws I fair by definition. So you can imagine almost immediately those who are big are going to do everything they can to say that government can't do anything good. So let us just do what we want. As it would turn out, they would spend billions and be very successful on this. It's kind of blowing me away how much money that has been spent to try to get more laws on fair. Number two, I forgot, but I'm sure it was really important. Middle class. I've been forgetting things today. I'm getting old. I don't need to hit my head anymore to forget things. It just happens. I've had a few concussions. I'm sure that didn't help. We've had people here with the concussion. You have, right? You? No? My advice, don't get concussions. It's good advice, right? All right, so middle class and urban. There's a couple reasons why this is important. First off, remember middle class does not mean the middle. The median. Middle class means People who can afford the trappings of an upper class life, but have to work. So they can't just also not work and be fine. And there are people who are benefiting and get that somewhere benefiting from capitalism. They like capitalism for the most part. They like tenets of it because they're benefiting from it. They can enjoy things they could they probably would not have enjoyed before. Capitalism is opening up opportunities. So be very clear, they like capitalism but they think there are rough edges that are, can cause real problems. So there's the benefits of capitalism, whatever, whatever profession they might be. So it'd be middle management for companies, even only smaller companies or the professionals or lawyers or doctors or whatever it might be. But they're middle class. You know, most people are working class, so they need almost everything to survive. So we're talking about this kind, have some of the, you know, have things like electricity in your, electricity in your home. And going to the 20th century, you know, having your own carriage, a place to keep your, your uh, to keep a horse, but to rent a horse. New York City had over 4 million horses in that year. That's why they thought cars were so great and no more pollution. 
Yeah, I know. Crazy thing about it. Think about manure and four million horses. Think about a rainy day. Now think about a dry day and everything turns to dust. Ah, city life. But that's the thing about it. So first off, we have people who are benefiting, so they want to keep it. And so their idea is, we need more middle class people. In fact, get that down, we need more people like us. If there are more people like us, then we will benefit from it and want to keep it and protect this system. If there's fewer, there might be more people to get rid of it and replace it with something else. Yeah. Who would want to get rid of it? Anarchists. Oh, okay. You know, communists believe the capitalists are wrong, so they want to replace it with something totally different. Remember, capitalism, you have clear owner, you know, clear yeah. capitalism. And so, talking revolution. And, one more thing, urban. Okay, people live in rural areas, and I know we live in a mighty urban metropolitan area like Helena. And God, you look at the metropolitan area, yeah, Helena, and then East Helena, Montana City, I mean, it's just people there. You go to a bigger city and you're literally living on top of each other. You need rules. You have to be able to work together. I mean, just for little things like whether it be for public safety or garbage or noise or you name it. That's why you see people in more urban areas are generally more pro-government. They want government to do things because they need government. In the rural areas, since they don't really contact people. They don't think you need it as much. There's a real different rural versus urban attitude. It's huge. Just live in the city for a while, and you know what I mean. Because you're living on top of each other. So that's why it was different than the farmers' movement. This idea is we got to control these people. Three. How to do it? Regulation. They believed we could have government regulation. Now remember, we talked about regulation we talked about the ICC, remember the Interstate Commerce Commission? Oh, I gotta record your grades on your DVD, I'll get it back tomorrow. And most of you didn't mention the ICC, there was a pair of one documents on it. And that was really good mentioning the Interstate Commerce Commission. There's a few people who are looking at me like, uh, you obviously didn't. <laughs> but that was a really good one to put in there. And what they thought, we could come up with rules. But there, there's a problem, the progressive had an answer for the problem, what about like the ICC, where railroad men were on the regulatory boards. Well, before we get to that, they thought they could regulate things like cutthroat competition. But also, now when I mean cutthroat competition, I mean things like in the jungle. The reason I wanted you to underline all that stuff in the jungle, why were they doing things? Okay, no one knew it, they could, but why? Well, there, was even, there was competition. What were they trying to do? Why would they have filthy environments? Why would they have sawdust they would use Huh? Because it does what? So they can undercut it, they want to cut their what? Their costs. They can cut their costs and that means they can lower their, their prices and still make money. They're all trying to cut costs. So they got to do something to, to about, or if you use regulate competition, therefore you can ensure crazy things like safe food or safe products. And that also includes working conditions. They thought they could regulate working conditions. You set up rules and limitations for more safe working conditions. Or for that matter, things like uh, if you get injured on the job, you need to be protected. That would eventually come with a new deal called workers' compensation, workers' comp. So another one was they believed in antitrust. Antitrust means what trust was synonymous with what? Well, a pool was a form of that. Trust became monopoly. Yeah, trust meant monopoly. But when you talk about trust, they said you're creating monopolies. They wanted more competition. More competition would lead to innovation and lower prices. So that's what they wanted, antitrust. The big stifles competition and gives them extraordinary amounts of power. They also thought they could regulate professions. I started adding like four Fs. I was gonna keep writing Fs on profession. Let's do this right. 
<laughs> Professions. What made you a doctor in 1880? I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm quick with a knife. What? Not, no, not in 1880. All you had to do is say, I'm a doctor. Let me cure you. That's enough. It was a sight. Huh? Yeah, it worked. That's what's so much better. What made you a lawyer? I'm a lawyer. There were no professional requirements for anything. One of the big progressive reforms starting at the state level was to make not only professional education requirements, at least some kind of requirements for uh, different professions, but also setting up the bodies that would do that. The Bar Association is a progressive reform to set up professional standards for lawyers. So that's why they did that. You have to, and so the American Medical Association started as a progressive era of reform to put some kind of requirement to say, I'm a doctor because I actually kind of did some doctor training. No, I went to medical school or something like that. So when you say, when you say about their parents, you have enough money to afford medical school, which if you don't know, it's really expensive. 20, 30 bucks a year. Yeah, it's super. 20 or 30 bucks a second. That's probably too little. Maybe 1920, but not 1890, you just say it. So this idea that we can train them, we set requirements, regulation, this is what you have to do. And so the first teaching schools, for example, came about. So that you, you have to do this to become a teacher. That kind of thing. And so they thought they could also regulate lives. And so in the cities, for example, you're going to have things such as building codes or zoning to say that you've got to build buildings that will be safe. Because cities were building buildings, especially apartment buildings, where they could pack as many people in a tenement as possible. And they were all incredibly unsafe. And they were building them literally right next to each other. So fire, fire in one building would spread throughout the building. And so building codes or zoning so there wouldn't be, you know, a, a factory or a toxic waste dump right next to a school, which I think would add to the fun. But even though if you know anything about New York City, they, they do put those things in poorer neighborhoods, but that's another story. And if we can control people's lives and regulate it, an example of this would be the desire for prohibition. What's prohibition? You can't get rid of drinking. The idea being if we just get rid of people, teach people not to do this, then that will improve families, get rid of spousal and child abuse, family, working class families, about more money to spend on their families, if this will totally alter society. In fact, it will be like a grand experiment to remake society. There was a prohibition party for this entire area. You see it kind of growing as years go by. And they're progressive. They're always sympathetic to this. Ah, there we go. Actually, they're just stopping there. Not a bathroom. No, not a bathroom. No. Really? I think somebody put it in. <laughs> What's that? Well, she learns a bad from the science one. It was alive, then they'd catch it. It was fun. I definitely remember that one. Torture a flying rat. Nice. That's all bats are, right? Flying. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. So, prohibition. But when World War II hit, did I say World War II? Yeah. World War One. When that happened, it would begin the movement to uh, the last real progressive way would be to get uh, to get prohibition to win the war because obviously Germans want you to drink beer beer was German they started with banning beer then eventually all prohibition we'll get to that when we get to the 1920s and <laughs> all of these 
So, next, number four. Who would do it? A faith in experts. Faith in experts. What they believed is they could find these experts, people who could solve the problems, people who could, who would be unbiased and come up with real solutions for what's going on. And so a name for that going into the 20th century will soon be these experts will be called technocrats. And technocrats will be not polit or not people running for office or running for or have powerful positions based on charisma or slogans. It's because of their experience and their expertise. The idea is we will hire experts. And you will see that one of the things that kind of ended liberalism, I think. Liberalism really had its downfall in the 1980s. So these are mostly Democrats by then. Democrats really do the technocratic thing now. Obama, a lot of his appeal, yes, there was an emotional appeal, but he was an expert, really smart, he was a technocrat. Hillary Clinton ran for president right now, technocrat. I mean, she's really playing on my experience. I have done things, I've done this, 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 and this. Instead of you know, the more emotional, political, or emotional response to some politician, like her opponent does. So that's the technocrats. And the thing was, is that they did everything they can then to think, okay, we'll pick experts, therefore, fitting in the same idea, they're anti-political party. Anti-political party. They want to limit the power of political parties. And I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, but the parties, as they saw it, Either the parties would be only working for themselves, or they're so involved in the competition against the other parties, because parties used to be really strong in the United States, that this was weakening the system. Now, parties are actually shockingly weak today, but they used to be really strong. I guess they got what they wanted. Yeah. So the, tech, the technocrats were anti-political? No, the, well, the tech, yeah. The progressives saw themselves as, the, you know, we want experts, and so another name for the experts are technocrats. Okay. And the and the reason they had faith in experts is because they wanted to get rid of political parties. And so then the idea would be... Oh, the progressives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, and so the progressives saw themselves as experts. Does that make sense? Yeah. And later on, they'll be called tech, the idea is tech progress. And if you get rid of political parties then, you will elect only experts. You'll pick, instead of elections will be, who's the best person to do the job? You know what I'm talking about? And you always hear people say that today. I find it a fascinating attitude. How do you know someone's the best for the job? Most of the time. What do you know about them? Yeah, whatever they, whatever image. It's already flawed from the beginning. Remember going back to the Law Cabin campaign? The image. Image is more important. And so, this idea sounds good, but it's really hard in practice. Really hard. Five. This progressive idea in social justice. It should be similar to social morality. And this idea that we must, or that we live in a community that we live in a community. We are here for the common good. Or, or this concept that we must have policies that would do the best for the greatest number. So help as many people as possible. The greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, this is called, actually, uh, there's a name for that, greatest good for the greatest number. It's got this very awkward name. It's from Jeremy Bentham in England called utilitarianism. They're very utilitarianists. Do the greatest good for the greatest number. So you don't want to just help a few. It's impossible to help to do everything for everybody. 
for the greatest good for the greatest number. So you can't do whatever you want. This is a basic idea. So there's an element with the populace, but also it does, by definition, leave some people behind because you can't do it for, it's for the greatest number. And so we have these basic ideas, but there are a couple little flaws to them. Big flaws. Oh, I forgot number six. Sorry. So what they want is more democracy or democracy. Now you notice I'm not capital D. We're not talking about the first democratic party, the democracy. I just mean more small d democracy, the concept of democracy. No, they don't want a democracy. We don't aren't a democracy, but they want regular people to have more of a voice. They want regular people to have more power. Or another way to look at it is they want the people to become truly sovereign. So the people can make sovereign decisions. And so they wanted to take some of the decisions out of the hands of politicians and give it to the people. Now I gotta be clear about it, about this. They're a little bit contradictory. And this is gonna be a problem within the pro progressives. So here on one hand you say, I want the people to have more decisions. And on the other hand you say, I want experts to solve our problems. That's by definition a contradiction. And so there are contradictions in here, and there are, but there's contradictions all the time in things. That's part of the reason why they're anti-party. Yeah. Can you say what contradiction means? What, what contradiction yeah. means? Or no. contra what? Oh, what two things? This is implying that they want average people to have more of a voice. So it's implying that. But then it turns around and say, we have faith in you individual experts to solve our problems. So we want the people to have more voice. At the same time, we're saying, but experts will solve our problems, like one or two people. Like, that's a contradiction. Actually, what they're really saying, we'll vote for experts. That's part of the reason why the progressives wanted women's suffrage. Women will vote for progressives. That's what they assumed. And actually, yeah, women tend to be a little bit more on that scale than men do. But there's another element. They're very nativist. Very nativist. The progressives would be the one to want uh, limitations on immigration. The progressives were worried about Eastern European radicals. It was the progressives that feared these things. It'd be progressive scientists who got into something called eugenics. Anybody? A couple of you might remember what eugenics were from last year, even though I know we covered a lot of stuff in AP Europe. Do you remember, do you remember what eugenics was? Yeah. Race, yeah. The idea was you can't have race mixing. So we must keep purity of races. So you can't allow for impure or inferior races. Because eugenics believe that if you have two different races, mix. They use race mixing all the time. Remember, I've used this before. The regressive traits from the inferior race will be spread off. And so basically what they're saying, you'd have almost like reverse evolution. And if you allow for race mixing, eventually the entire society will regress. Now, of course, this is absolutely pure science and not true at all. It's garbage. And it, so it does tell you one thing. They had some social Darwinism in there. There was a strong social Darwinistic tinge. So, what did they feel about equality of the races then, many, many progressives? They weren't equal. They what? They weren't equal. They, mm -hmm. they were very, as a whole, many of the progressives were racist. The most racist president in history, that's saying a lot, was the progressive Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson would be the president to bring Jim Crow to the federal government. It'd be Woodrow Wilson who would order the segregation of the brand new Lincoln Memorial in 1913. The irony should just be overwhelming about that one. It would be Woodrow Wilson. Is it? Well, Woodrow Wilson was interesting. But that are the, so we got a complex thing. And let's be clear, on this trend line, it would be liberalism 
that would um, pass laws that would at least by law end discrimination based upon race. It would be liberalism that passed laws to at least kind of say you can't discriminate based upon sex. And so it's a continuous from, okay, we haven't gone only white men and white people, but eventually go on that way. It, that's the continuum. It's not going to be consistent. So somebody here is not going to be, oh yeah, since we're on the same continuum, I would agree exactly with, with uh, Teddy Roosevelt or something. Who was a Republican? Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat. Remember what I said, the progressives came in both, both parties. Today people call themselves progressives all the time, and that's those are kind of dis, they're descendants of that. But it's a change. So, who are the muckrakers? Muck rakers. Hmm. It will be on your quiz on Monday. Like that? That's a part. That can go in your portfolio. Or you just cut it out. I used to have this old whiteboard over there. I, I had very elaborate plans for it, and then they took it from me. I was so mad. Yeah. I was going to use that and cover up the. Mr. Carter's roof used to be across the hall. And when he shut his door, I was going to. Try to think. I had it all planned. So we opened his door and it'd be a white <laughs> I had it all planned. I was gonna kind of make a little hole so he wouldn't hear me. I had this all planned out for a great trick on him. And then they took the white bolts. And he moved the closet. No, then he moved. Imagine, I mean I stacked a bunch of books when I come took everything in that closet and stacked in front of this door. That was good. <laughs> they did it to me. See, there's a remnant of it. See those cinder blocks? Some kids did this to me, some students. They covered all the inside of the wall. So, but they didn't do a very good job hiding because they're all standing outside. I could watch my reaction when I opened the door. Just the wall. <laughs> Somebody let them in that window. Yeah, everyone's out to get me. All right, so muckrakers. Muckrakers obviously rape the muck. It, it's not a characteristic progressive, but it's, they are progressive. Does that make sense? They are progressives. And muckrakers were reporters who authors, reporters or authors, who showed some of the excesses of capitalism. So they were showing, now excesses, remember, define excess. Some people are going to have different attitudes about the excess of capitalism. Well, they saw it as competition or monopolies or what's going into products or unsafe things are. That's excesses of capitalism. Yeah. Are these progressive? Then? Yeah, these are progressive. Now it's not a characteristic anymore. These are just just print like uh, yeah, yeah, like the part, 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 Yeah, they're authors, uh, journalists. That's yeah. authors and writers. Yeah, uh, you know, journalists. One of the best known and actually pretty remarkable, considering the fact that women could rarely have this kind of position or influence. I mean by the attitude of women, so she's an incredible person. My name is Ida Tarbell. And Ida Tarbell wrote about the excesses of Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller. And eventually, they would break up Standard Oil, beginning under the presidency of Roosevelt, but finish under the presidency of Taft. Another example would be a magazine called The Nation. A reporter who went through the inner cities of the inner city of New York and saw how this vast number, we're talking over a million of the working class people and the kind of lives they were forced to leave overcrowded in these nightmarish tenements was a man by the name of Jacob Reeds. Those are two odds. And he wrote how the other half lives. Showing the lives and really putting a movement to the progressives. We need building codes. You know, we need something to ensure that ensure that people aren't living in areas where they have no access to sewers or water or anything like that. Jacob Rees was one, and one more. He wasn't a muckraker. 
actually Teddy Roosevelt gave him this name as kind of a derogatory nickname, but it stuck. He wasn't a muckraker, but everyone calls him a muckraker. The man who wrote the jungle. Who wrote the jungle? Upton Sinclair, because his work is gonna have direct impact on law and lead to regulation. Yeah. What we read for nation. The Nation was a, a, a muckraking magazine. Still around today. The Nation is one of the most widely read magazines in the, in the United States today. I say that with a, a little touch of irony. Magazines are dying really fast. You know, when I was a kid, magazines were awesome. News magazines, that's where you got everything. Today, they're just, it's, it's pretty amazing how things have changed. I don't know if that's necessarily for the better. You know, all the reporters used to work for them on that jobs. So we don't, we don't get as good news today. I've had quality news, and that's gone. It was a lot better back then, too, which is a shame, which is really bad. But then again, there's also this idea that you can literally just now just check your phone and get instantaneous information is pretty remarkable. I was doing that in the election Monday for the caucus. I was just kind of hitting refresh on this thing. I was keeping continuous track of the vote. I couldn't even imagine doing that. Of course, I couldn't. That's why you guys have no idea how to talk my thoughts. Right? 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 You couldn't have made it. You wouldn't have your sugar water. We didn't have stuff like that. I could have made some. You can. High fructose corn syrup is a very elaborate distilling process. I know the. Oh, you have that in your basement? Your backyard shop? Did you make the plastic too? No, I won't. I do enjoy how they sell, how they market. There's nothing wrong with drinking sweet stuff. I mean, whatever you know, probably should not drink too much. But like I said, ion or advanced electrolyte system. It's just sugar. That's all it is. If it tastes good, fine, drink it. But I think it's kind of fun. I never even drink it. Huh? I never even want to drink it. You just mm, blue means tasty. Very few things are natural. You should have thrown it to Carter. Just grab it out. Dish it out. Here we go. Standard only I can do that. <laughs> so let me finish this real fast. Chop chop. Upton Sinclair, he wrote the jungle. He was not a muckraker. He was not somebody saying, hey, we gotta fix capitalism. I forgot something. Remember what I told you? I'm getting old in the phone. I don't even know what class this is. Let's talk about atomic unification. I forgot something about the characteristics for cap for uh, progressives. Just write in your margin and don't give me that book. I work for a living. Right? I work in that. That's another quote. Actually, it's kind of true, but another one. And one of the character characteristics, all these things have one thing in common. All the reason they had this idea, the reason they felt this way, was their fear of revolution. That's what they really feared. They didn't want to get rid of capitalism, they wanted to save capitalism. So they're going to have to have some regulation. They're going to have to do something about size and competition or this vast numbers of people might revolt. Now, the opponents of the progressives, because the progressives are going to want a lot of the same things that labor unions want, populists want, and socialists want, are going to be branded as what? When you want to attack somebody, what do you call them? Bomb-throwing anarchists. No, anarchists want to get rid of capitalists. Capitalism. They want to say Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal. I don't know if he was right about here when I wrote it. He wanted to say, in fact, I think he did, saved capitalism. And so, back to this. Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle. He was a socialist. He was a socialist. 
He wanted you to read the jungle and come out of there saying capitalism is horrible. We need to get rid of capitalism completely and replace it with a socialist system where the workers control the means of production. So that's why he wrote about this. That's why he had all these horrible situations. Yeah, he wanted you to be uncomfortable reading about humans both going into lard. And I'm saying, like, cool. I mean, who doesn't? You want to watch a movie, you know, get a big bucket of lard, and spoon. Right? That's really good. Huh? Yeah, really good. <laughs> yeah, at least now you can put your own butter on. When I was a kid, they would put it on for you, and it would literally be like that much of that oil. Yeah. So, so Sinclair wasn't a progressive. Like, he was not a progressive. Okay. He was a socialist. Remember, pro progressives want to save yeah. capitalism. So what are we talking about? So we're talking about the jungle. So we're going to get to the jungle because he he's going to be called a muckraker. So that's why I included him there. Uh, so people and the book calls him a muckraker, but he wasn't a muckraker. He was a socialist. He wanted you to read about how awful the working conditions were and say that's what capitalism does. We gotta get rid of capitalism. Yeah, he's a full fledged, he's a moderate socialist, but he's a socialist. Yeah, it's part of the progressives because his book will lead directly to regulations that the progressives want. And as Upton Sinclair said, I aim for their heart, but I hit their stomach. Because people read it like, I'm eating this slot? Now, as you all know, caveat emptor was the model of cap or of laissez-faire capitalism, correct? Caveat emptor. That's obvious. I mean, we all speak Latin these days. I mean, that's what all the kids, and that's all the cool kids. Huh? Yeah, this is, this is how it's fitting with the genre. Why caveat emptor? No, they just threw your back to Oh, they threw the pen in? Yeah. Somebody threw my pen. Where was it? Oh, uh, I'm trying to get into Mr. Carter's room. We're gonna run out of time because the entire those movies. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Lastly, what, what caveat enter means is buyer beware. Buyer beware. If you buy a product and it's not good, who's fault is it? The buyers. Yeah. And but the idea of loss after capitalism was let's say a, a store or a company sells you something that's bad. You know, something what what will you do? Sure. Maybe, but you go to another store, right? And what would the store that sells the bad stuff? What will happen? But a business, or not to change. Well, you see how this could be different with food. You buy something that kills you. I guess you won't buy their product anymore. Oh, now I get to go to conspiracy theories. So. We're doing conspiracy theories and special topics. Well, conspiracy stands. No, he's not for food. The story was about how bad working conditions were and how bad the products were. And what he's saying is that capitalism causes this. So we got to get rid of capitalism. But when the middle class readers of the book read that, they say, we got to regulate capitalism. So he was trying to show that capitalism bad? Yeah. Try to show capitalism is bad, but instead it turned into, oh, you're here. Well, you did. I'm so glad you're here today. Oh, thanks. Maybe you were, I kind of came at first. I would have turned, oh, I can't even get some time. We're doing conspiracies. Yes. We were going to do polls and I changed my mind. We're going to do polls now. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I like these ones. And then, uh, I have a... <laughs> now, where were you? I was the only two. And Hannah was gone for a couple of days. I'm sick right now. I'm not going to school.